today we are discussing the day that changed history in modern warfare, the Battle of Balaclava, October 25th, 1854. Today with me, Captain Gibbons. Sir. We are here to talk about the day that changed warfare. So tell us about what do people today think about when they hear about the Battle of Balaclava? Two things generally come to mind. Uh, the first, far most famously, is the Charge of the Light Brigade. The uh, supposed blunder. Someone had blundered. Someone had blundered. The, There's not a the reason Tennyson why. poem, There's But to Do and Die, Into the Valley of Death. Uh, that, as far as people have heard of the ba Battle of Balaclava, um, I'd wager the overwhelming majority outside of academia have not. But uh, among those with even a passing familiarity is the Charge of the Light Brigade. And uh, second to that is uh, a phrase that's uh, recently uh, been readopted, you could say, by military and law enforcement as the, either the thin red line or the thin blue line. But that phrase originated at the Battle of Balaclava, and it was the 93rd Highlanders, uh, a thin, thin line of red-coated British infantry that uh, repulsed a Russian cavalry charge and was famously quoted as the a thin red streak, as William Howard Russell put it, but has ever since been famously misquoted as the thin red line. Now, to set the stage for the Battle of Balaclava, we have to go back and analyze the entire Crimean campaign. When it was decided that the Allied um, powers, France, um, the Ottoman Empire, and Britain, of course, um, decided to attack the Russians. It was decided that we would land at in and around Sebastopol and try to take Sebastopol uh, by siege if necessary um, in 1853, of course. And it was decided that we would land in Kalamata Bay and cross the River Alma, which is the Battle of Alma, another episode that we'll be talking about that, um, and then ended up landing north, but ended up south of Sebastopol, and Balaclava famously is the harbor whence most of the um, supply had been moved in, and since the armies were beginning to encircle Sebastopol, the Russian counterattack was aimed at the weaker defenses at Balaclava. Now, the first of the Russian attacks this day um, actually fell against um, the Ottomans because the Ottomans had been tasked with defending a number of redoubts or small temporary forts which were guarding the um, outer parts of the Valley of Balaclava. And um, these were actually um, not the best Ottoman troops. Um, period accounts actually refer to them as Turkish militia. But today, a lot of the accounts, we know that they are Asnan, or very young um, uh, recruits, that are aged 20 to 25. And um, we, we know now that most of them were actually Egyptian. Um, the Russian assault, of course, hits the first Turkish Redoubt, um, they are uh, overrun, and the rest of the Redoubts, um, at the order of their officers, decide to uh, withdraw. And so that, through history, comes off as the Turks ran. Yeah, and so described in British sources as, as third-rate yes. Turkish soldiers. And, and they're not the best Turkish so soldiers, but they're also not dealing with the best of circumstances, no? They, they were not. They were inadequately armed and uh, poorly supplied at best. Uh, some accounts describe them as practically starving in these forts, because you have to bear in mind, Balaclava is to the south of Sevastopol. The main Allied armies are entrenched around Sevastopol itself. And so Balaclava by this point is an afterthought. These redoubts are an afterthought of, oh, just in case the Russians send a force down uh, the Crimean Peninsula and they try to cut us off from the rear, we need some level of defense to slow them down to protect our line of communication through Balaclava. So these forts were, were an afterthought. They were uh, 
There's period accounts uh, of, of foresighted officers who in the end were proven right were uh, telling Lord Raglan, you need to improve these defenses because if we were the Russians, this is the weak point, this is where we would hit. And what sort of armament does the, the redoubt have? The British gave them, loaned them uh, a number of British guns. This is uh, light artillery pieces. Uh, but again, they weren't, um, they weren't particularly good guns and they were, this, this was the reserve of the reserve. Uh, the, the very back of the line places where we're not expecting to be attacked, but just in case uh, we'll put something there. And that's something where these, as the British described them, third rate Ottoman troops that uh, were not on the top of the list for supply and equipment and um, had been loaned a few British guns. British guns that ironically would uh, play a significant role in, uh, in what is shortly to come at Balaclava. So the Turk runs. It, the Turk withdraws and... Um, depending on who you ask. Yes, depending they on or withdraw. They, they withdraw or they run and um, the Russians obviously advance uh, to fill that gap. And it's the 93rd that comes up um, to actually cover that withdrawal, no? Uh, yeah, the 93rd did not... Uh, they, they were at Balaclava. I don't know if they moved up. But they did uh, form up outside on a, a small hill just north of Balaclava, and they're overlooking a valley uh, between them, right in front of Balaclava, there's a, a valley about a thousand yards wide, and then the redoubts that the Russians had taken, that the Turks had withdrawn from, uh, was about a thousand yards away. And so there, the Turks are withdrawing across this valley. Uh, some of them formed up with them, some of them did not. Uh, but the, the 93rd of uh, the Sutherland, High, Sutherland Highlanders under uh, Sir Colin Campbell was uh, among the handful of actual British forces that were there. The, uh, the redoubts were not supposed to collapse that quickly. The purpose of the redoubts were to delay a Russian attack long enough so that the British or the French could send forces from how far were they eight from? miles approximately oh. from Sebastopol. So the the logic went that if the Russians did try to attack uh, attack us from the rear, take our line of communications at Balaclava, they would have enough time to counter that by moving forces south uh, on their on um, what the British would see as their interior line. They'd get there in time to hold Balaclava against a, a Russian attack. But as it happened, the Russians took the, the redoubts very quickly. Uh, they uh, captured the British guns that had been borrowed. And, uh, and this is primarily an attack of Russian infantry, a very large number of Russian infantry, possibly 20,000 or more troops. But then so comes the cavalry, no? With cavalry, yes. The Russian infantry did not advance very far at all uh, Why beyond is that? the redoubts. Because the Russian infantry, now this is my theory, uh, that the Russian infantry had been smarted by the British at the Battle of Alma mm. only uh, about a month earlier, uh, where they had the Russian infantry learned firsthand, very surprisingly, the power of the new British Minier rifle, the pattern P-51 rifle, which had an effective range out to um, 600 yards uh, for a, a man-sized target and uh, up to a thousand yards for an area target, like a target. Whereas the Russians regiment. could only engage at, at 200, 200 yards at most. They were still armed with generally flintlock smoothbore muskets. And so the Russian infantry that had taken these readouts from the Turks, well, first they had fought the Turks. Uh, the Turks, depending on whose account you read, either fought poorly or fought well. Uh, the fact they fought at all is, uh, plus one for the British because uh, the Russians at least had to engage them and were winded from assaulting a, from redoubts or fortified positions with guns in them. Uh, but the, the Russians had certainly by this point not been defeated. They were not exhausted. As they're looking out across this thousand yards of open ground, they see they're looking down from the heights down into Balaclava. They could see the harbor, they could see the buildings, they could see the British stores uh, that had been landed from the ships. And the only thing that stood between them was, uh, again, the 93rd Highlanders, with the regular British regiment, 
some Turkish troops and uh, a few battalions of Royal Marines, mm. but the Russian infantry would have surely seen the feather bonnets and the, the crimson red uniforms of the 93rd Highlanders formed up in line. And that was enough uh, to at least add one reason among the many, the inexplicable reasons for why the Russians did not continue their advance into Balaclava. Uh, by all the conventional dictates of warfare, nothing stood between them. Just a handful, there were uh, only a few hundred British troops in the... And they knew bit. that they were a rifle-armed regiment based on how the, the Highland Brigade was engaged at Alma. Probably, and they, they probably could have just assumed that after they had been so roughly handled by the... But the Royal Marines was, did not. The Royal Marines at this time, uh, in October 54, were still armed with the, the older smoothbores. But of course, the Russian infantry would have had no way of knowing this. Oh, right. uh, the, uh, the only British troops in Crimea at the time, the 4th Division, which would come up later in the battle, uh, the 4th Division was still armed with smoothbores, either P-39s or P-41 smoothbore muskets. Every other division, all the other uh, regiments and battalions, by this point had been armed with a P-51 mm. mini rifle. And that had uh, surprised the Russians at uh, Alma. When they're being, when they're receiving effective infantry musketry fire from an enemy at ranges be, at which prior to then uh, infantry could not hurt you from, it was uh, it was a shock. The Russians, uh, well, the Russians had been attacked at Alma. They had been up on the heights. The British attacked them, and the Russians suffered twice as many casualties as the attackers. So this is already turning history or military convention on its head. Indeed. And so these Russian forces uh, at this point uh, probably were hesitant knowing that the British had rifles to cross this thousand yards of open ground. It would have taken uh, quite a while for infantry to cross a thousand yards. Uh, and in that time, a, uh, a trained uh, British rifle battalion could, uh, could fire thousands and thousands of rifle bullets effectively at them. And never bear in mind, these are trained soldiers of the 93rd. Uh, they were, uh, they received a handful of P-51 rifles before they left England. They received even more of them at Malta and they were trained on the rifle under uh, Colonel Lane Fox, who had been sent from the School of Musketry to Malta to train these soldiers. And everyone, whether you were a soldier that still had the smooth war musket or you had the new P-51, everyone was trained on the new rifle. And finally at Varna, in, um, on the coast of the Black Sea, immediately they embarked from Varna before they landed at uh, Kalamata Bay. Uh, everyone in the 93rd, the entire regiment, had been issued with the, the P-51 rifle. And this is the work of Lord Harding who uh, shortly after the death, he became a commander in chief of the British Army. He was the driving force behind giving every British soldier a, uh, a rifle. And the 93rd had received these, uh, had been fully equipped with them at Varna, and period accounts say they were conducting considerable target practice with them. Mm. So these are trained soldiers, they had received trained instruction from, uh, from a Colonel Lane Fox from the School of Musketry, which had been founded a couple years earlier. So these are soldiers that understood how to estimate the distance to the target, they knew how to properly adjust their sights, they knew how to load their weapons. They're trained, and by this point, uh, they knew how to use their weapons. And based on our experience with the American Civil War, not every army puts that much effort into the individual soldiers' uh, familiarity with the rifle and familiarity with just judging distance, any of that? No, uh, many American Civil War regiments, and I might even go out on them and say most, did little to no musketry training, uh, and, and there's a large number that didn't fire. These soldiers were volunteer soldiers, entered the army, they don't fire around until they're actually being engaged by the enemy. Well, that's a conversation. For a That's for the future. Um, yes. But the 93rd, by even by British Army standards, uh, 
by later British Army standards, were very poorly trained in the rifle, mm -hmm. even though by this point they had uh, more training than the average American Civil War regiment would have had. Uh, by within three or four years, they would have been considered uh, trained to a, a substandard level uh, to, uh, to that which was expected of British Army regiments by the, the later 1850s. But for the Battle of Balaclava, uh, for our purposes, they have a, a modern weapon, a rifle that the individual soldier can aim with, uh, with effectiveness out to 600 to 1,000 yards, and, uh, and the, their enemy know this, because their enemy have already gotten a bloody nose. And so that's, that's why you believe most of the infantry did not advance. It's an explanation. Clock. It's a possibility. Uh, historians have scratched their heads at why didn't the Russians advance at Balaclava. They had overwhelming numerical superiority. They had taken the, the primary resistance. I mean, the, the readouts on top of this ridge were the primary British line. They had broken, or the Allied line, I should say, they had broken through that line and they had the numbers. It was very early in the day. It was about 9.30 in the morning by the time they had taken these readouts. Yet they stopped, and one possible reason could be, and this is uh, my theory, was that this Russian infantry knew the 93rd, or that they saw the red coats of the British soldiers in the distance a thousand yards away, and they knew that we, if we advance from here, we will be under effective rifle fire the entire way, and we will not be able to actually fire back until we're within 200 yards. So we talked about infantry, British infantry, uh, being superior to Russian infantry here. Let's talk about infantry versus cavalry, because that's, that's what everyone knows from the thin red line, no? Yes. Uh, the Russian cavalry uh, may not have been engaged at uh, Alma. Alma was primarily an infantry battle. Um, and the Russians were on the defense. So if you're on the defense, you, you don't engage your cavalry unless you're trying to exploit a weakness or, uh, or do a counterattack. Um, so the, and the cavalry may have, in typical cavalry fashion, uh, dismissed the concerns of the infantry uh, that were likely were hesitant to advance across a thousand open yards of ground against, uh, against British infantry. From the cavalry's perspective, this was a, a hussar, rather the Russian equivalent of a, a hussar regiment. I want to say it was the 17th. They saw fresh meat in the distance because there's a, a line of infantry, unsupported infantry. So this is a British infantry. Um, the heavy brigade of cavalry was coming up. It was not on the field uh, yet. They see a line of British infantry a thousand yards away, unsupported by artillery. And at about this time, the uh, Russians had placed guns up on the hills where the readouts were. And the Russian artillery, from a range of about a thousand yards, had opened fire on the, on the British and Allied line. There was uh, up, up to about 2,000 Allied troops mm -hmm. there, of which there was the 93rd Highlanders and then a, an assortment of other Turkish regiments on the smoothbores. And uh, when he came under artillery fire, Colin Campbell, the commander of the 93rd, advanced his um, regiment uh, a short distance so that the soldiers were slightly behind uh, the crest of a very shallow hill uh, and had them lie down. And this gave them just enough cover. This uh, probably wasn't more than just a few feet of elevation. Just don't think of a a large hill he was behind, a, a shallow bump in elevation. Mm. And he advanced his soldiers to that and had them lie down or kneel down. And this was enough so that the, the shot from the guns, uh, at, at least it was provided some measure of cover. And the uh, Russian artillery saw this. So what they see is they see British infantry, unsupported, under fire from artillery, hunkering down, taking cover. And uh, for, for cavalry, this is a win-win situation. The cavalry begin to advance because under the rules of conventional warfare, of Napoleonic, European, Western warfare, the British now, uh, the, the infantry have two options when they see cavalry coming at them while they're under artillery fire. 
Option one is to form square. This is the formation that you adopt when you are being charged by a cavalry. It uh, brings all your infantry into a dense square. And uh, the horse, uh, horse is not a particularly bright animal, but it's not dumb enough to charge into uh, three ranks deep of soldiers with bayonets. Uh, the, horse is just, the horse will not do it. And the, they will invariably break and go around the square. And while the cavalry do that, they uh, subject themselves to the fire from the soldiers in the square. However, that formation is uh, a beautiful target for artillery. So if the cavalry advance and they force the infantry to go into square to resist cavalry, that means the gunners up on the hill can knock them over like bowling pins at their leisure. So either way, the Russian uh, or belief going into this is the British are about to have a bad day. No matter what they choose to do, we're going to um, have our way with them, whether they stay in line and uh, therefore are vulnerable to the cavalry charge, or whether they form square and we can just plunk cannonballs through the ranks with their artillery, uh, the, the advantage, the uh, initiative is completely on the Russian side. And, uh, and the Russian cavalry probably were thinking, well, there's a bit of glory in this for us too, because if we route this thin red line of British infantry, there's nothing else between us and Balaclava. We can say we were the first ones into Balaclava uh, in this great victory that uh, took the, the line of communications uh, of our enemies and destroyed all their supplies. So there's a, a strong motivation to just knock these British and Turkish infantry away and uh, take Balaclava. So then the cavalry begins to advance, no? They do. Um, and a, and a cavalry charge, the cavalry cannot gallop the entire way. They have a thousand yards of ground to cover. Uh, so they would advance the first several hundred yards at a walk, and then the next few hundred yards at a slow cant, and then the next few hundred yards at a slow trot. And the last 150 yards or so is the actual charge. And it takes time, even from the trot to a, a full run, for the horse to build up that speed. And uh, it's, it's a catastrophic thing being charged from cavalry. Because uh, that last 150 yards when they break into their run, a, a good light cavalry could cover that in six seconds, uh, or, or no more than 10. So if you're a infantryman, in, in the context of warfare that the Russians are fighting in at the Battle of Balaclava, infantry with, with musketry have a maximum effective range of about 150 yards. So if you're, a, if you're an infantryman and you're being charged by cavalry and you see this wall of horse and steel charging at you, you know you have one shot and you have six seconds in which to deliver that shot. And uh, if that one shot does not stop this charging mass, you know you are about to be smashed by tons of horse flesh and men and, and that's steel. why that instinct is and to that the square. instinct is well the instinct is generally to run and that's exactly what the Turkish troops did mm -hmm. that were uh, supporting the the British the Turkish troops ludicrously fired one volley at uh, about seven eight hundred yards and then turned and ran with smooth bore. with smooth bores it was a completely ineffective pointless um, if if one musket ball hit one Russian cavalry horse, I would be, I would honestly be surprised. They fired and, and ran because they knew what was coming. They're like, there's, we're out here, we're standing here in the middle of the open. Uh, we have no artillery supporting us, there's no cavalry supporting us, and we've got one shot. And as soon as these cavalry get within range, they're going to lower their lances and plow right into us. And the square is very much ingrained into the British infantrymen. They, uh, it, in a way, they almost live in the, the shadow of their fathers and grandfathers at Waterloo. So at what point did Sir Colin make that call to go not into the square, but to form the line? Uh, he did not form square from the first. Uh, his, his famous quote was, um, you know, we will stand and die here. Uh, and he had already 
observe the power of this new weapon, the rifle musket at the at the Alma, where the 93rd was engaged, quite hotly, in fact. And he realized that if he formed square, only about 25% of his soldiers in this square are, would be able to deliver fire on the enemy cavalry as they advance with their rifles. If he keeps his soldiers in line, 100% of his soldiers can fire on the enemy as they advance. So he uh, very, uh, very courageously pla placed his faith in the rifle uh, on October 25th, 1854. Uh, abolishing the conventional wisdom that you must form square. That's the only thing you can do when unsupported infantry is charged by cavalry. Instead, he formed his, what William Howard Russell called a, a thin streak of red tipped with steel that uh, we know is the thin red line. And this just goaded the Russians on. They're like, these silly British are, this is going to be too easy. They're making it way too easy for us. We're going to knock them over like uh, bowling pins. And the, the Russian strategy, or their tactic, would have been not to charge directly at them, but uh, at the last moment of the charge, they would turn to one side, and then before the British could refuse their line, the cavalry would come around and take them from the flank and the rear. So, and, and there was, there's no escape from that, if you're infantry caught in that. It's just, you, you get run down and, and lanced and hacked to pieces. It's what, it's what a cavalryman lives for. So the Russian cavalry move up and uh, uh, Sir Colin Campbell waited until the, uh, the Russians were about 600 yards away when they fired their first volley. And the historians disagree on how many volleys were fired. It's pretty clear from the primary sources that they did fire three. The first at 300, uh, sorry, 600 yards. Uh, this one was not terribly effective, uh, and that makes sense. It is the longest range. The dispersion of, of uh, bullets would be the greatest at that range. But can you imagine being a, a Russian cavalryman, and you're charging infantry, and you're moving forward 600 yards away, you're still barely moving forward at a, a slow trot, and the, the enemy infantry in the distance fires at you, and you can see that they fire because there's a still black powder weapons, a great cloud of smoke, but you hear this whizzing zip of bullets about you and uh, some bullets inevitably hit targets. And the thought had to have crossed their mind, like, you know, whatever the Russian is for, you know, oh crap, <laughs> we are being effectively engaged by these British infantry. And I wonder if some quick pain of doubt crossed any of their minds. <laughs> Maybe we should pull back, but they didn't. Uh, they pressed on, and uh, the British had reloaded by the time they got within 350 yards, and there was a second volley. And uh, this was uh, very effective. At, at 300 yards, um, considering the trajectory of the bullet fired from the P-51 rifle, uh, all you had to do was aim pretty close and uh, and your target is still within the power of the rifle. At 600 yards, given the rainbow trajectory of the rifle, you have to estimate your distance pretty much exactly. Uh, if the enemy is at 600 yards and you set your sights to 700 yards, you're gonna send the bullets right over their heads. And if you set your sights for 500 yards, the bullets are gonna land in front of them. You have to get that range exactly right. But at 350 yards, you could set your sights to 400 to 300, and uh, and the bullets are still going to hit somewhere on that approximately eight-foot target from the top of the Russian cavalryman's head to the bottom of the hooves of the cavalry. And that second volley was incredibly devastating. Um, the Russian cavalry continued to advance, and they began to turn to, uh, to their right, but then the British left, to begin to go around. They were still intending to go around and take them from the rear, and uh, Colin Campbell um, refused or wheeled out uh, a few companies on his right flank, and they fired a third volley at very close range into the flank of the Russian cavalry as they were starting to uh, 
make their wheel around the, the British line. And that was it. At that point, they turned and began heading back towards uh, from whence they had come. And he didn't fire back into them, did he? He did not fire uh, as they withdrew. Uh, he, um, he said something to the effect of, you know, damn your impertinence for the soldiers that wanted to. The, the soldiers wanted to run and chase the cavalry. <laughs> and uh, he held them back. And he, with, with uh, tremendous chivalry, did not fire uh, into these retreating Russians. Um, and he certainly could have. He could have fired at them two or three more volleys uh, as they withdrew. And it's, uh, it's interesting that uh, many allied accounts uh, sometimes doubted the effectiveness of these volleys because not too many Russian cavalrymen or horses were left on the field. Uh, the volleys did not unsaddle very many uh, Russian cavalrymen. Because and the Russian they, accounts said they, they hung on. Yeah, there's, there's a, a wonderful account of a British soldier who went to St. Petersburg after the war, and he ended up talking with a, a one-legged Russian, and uh, they they both, uh, I, I suppose the Russian probably spoke some English, but uh, he said, uh, oh yeah, we were in the Crimea, and uh, the British soldier said, oh, I was as well, and where were you at? And the British soldier said, oh, I was at the Alma and uh, Balaclava, and the Russian cavalryman with the one leg, the former cavalry said, oh, it's also at the Balaclava. And we attacked this one little British unit in, right in front of the city. And the British soldier said, well, that was us. And the Russian cavalry uh, cavalrymen said their second volley had uh, basically wounded every man and horse in, in the entire Russian formation. And that uh, most of the men that had been wounded you do not want to be unhorsed in the middle of no man's land, uh, to borrow a later phrase, uh, in, in the middle of a battle. Because if you if you fell off your horse in the middle of that field, 350 yards away from the British line, that's where you'd bleed out and die. Especially if you're if you've just been hit by a 705 caliber um, British Minier rifle bullet. So they wounded or no, you hung on to your horse and tried to follow back to get back to your line. Um, uh, so that you don't fall off and, and die in the middle of this field. So, but from the British perspective, uh, the, the volleys were a little um, less than satisfying because there were relatively few Russian men and horses left on the field. But from the Russian account, their second volley in particular had, uh, according to that, that Russian uh, survivor, the one leg, uh, and that was where he had been hit, and then he lost his leg. Uh, but he hung on his horse long enough to get back to uh, their lines. Um, the, the, he said the British volley had been uh, incredibly effective at 350 yards, so 150 yards beyond what uh, what the Russian, uh, what Western military conventional thought at the time. 150 yards beyond the maximum range that infantry can actually reach out and effectively hurt you in battle. Hmm. Now, we've discussed infantry versus infantry. Russian infantry doesn't advance for a great portion of this battle. We've discussed cavalry versus infantry. Um, and in, of course, later on we can discuss uh, cavalry versus artillery because there's a lot to talk about when it oh, comes not to reason why. Yes, ours not to reason why today, but we're certainly going to reason why um, very soon with the uh, Chartered Light Brigade because um, <laughs> Lord Cardigan did nothing wrong. Um, but uh, let's let's discuss infantry versus artillery. Let's talk about that. Well, you can start off with. Uh the general truth, the unquestioned truth that infantry at ranges beyond 200 yards is ineffective against artillery. In fact, artillery up until this point, and this is uh, one of the reasons why I argue that Balaclava, October 25th, 1854, is the day war changed. Uh, the Russian artillerymen 
on that uh, battlefield on, uh, at Balaclava went into that battle under the assumption that uh, the firmly held and, and uh, justified assumption that infantry cannot hurt you unless they're within about 200 yards. And uh, for infantry to get within artillery to th that kind of range was uh, remarkably rare anyways. And uh, if infantry was foolish enough to get within artillery, the artillery had uh, a type of ammunition, a canister, that was uh, essentially a case full of musket balls, or a little larger than musket balls, but basically round iron or lead balls that turn their guns into massive shotguns. And that was effective to about 300, 350 yards. Um, it was, it's the most powerful thing on the battlefield. There's nothing more destructive than uh, artillery fire and canister into infantry um, as, uh, as Confederate troops would learn on, uh, in July at Gettysburg, 1863. But um, this, the, Infantry versus artillery exchange happens at the very end. In fact, the Battle of Balaclava is essentially over. This is after Lord Cardigan did nothing wrong. Uh, and those Turkish guns that, uh, that we mentioned had been in the redoubts. The Russians had captured them and were trying to hold them away. And so Lord Cardigan uh, was supposed to run them down. Well, Lord Raglan did not want those guns to be carried away. He did not. And just like we talked about with people living in the shadow of the Napoleonic Wars. Um, had any other British guns been carried away in, in uh, previous wars, really? Not in recent history, and Lord Raglan uh, knew very well that uh, Wellington, the old Iron Duke, who uh, had only died the year prior, had never lost a gun. Like in, in all his years on the peninsula and uh, in France and Belgium, uh, and in India, he had never lost a gun to the enemy. And so Lord Raglan was... Because, uh, of course, British guns had been captured before, but you didn't want to, um, you know... You, you didn't want to be the one... Shot. No, you didn't want to be the one to have to write back and say, yes, I lost the first British gun in, in 50 or 30 years. Yeah. <laughs> uh, if you don't count the... Uh, the Afghans took a few guns. Well, there's Gandamak and all that. Yes, they, they took a few guns in the re retreat from Kabul in, uh, in 41. But, um, anyway... The, woe to the 44th. And we'll, we'll be talking the about, we'll be talking we'll be about the, uh, the massacre at Gandamak um, another day. But, but the, um, the, the Russians, they took these Turkish readouts and the battle's over. The Light Brigade had charged and, and, uh, and that had... That was over. This was about uh, noon, or a little afternoon. And again, the whole purpose of the redoubts defending Balaclava was to delay the enemy's advance long enough that troops from Sevastopol, French and British troops, could take the interior lines down uh, quick enough to hold uh, Balaclava in the case of Russian attack. And uh, one of the units that had been uh, alerted very early that morning when report of the Russian attack on Balaclava was received was the, the two rifle battalions of the Rifle Brigade. This had uh, until recently uh, been the 95th Rifles. In 1816, in the downsizing of the British Army, they, were, they went from the Rifle Regiment to just the Rifle Brigade, but they're essentially the green jacket and 95th Rifles of uh, Napoleonic fame. And they were one of many units uh, Basically, the entire 4th Division under Cathcart had been sent uh, from the trenches of Balaclava down, or trenches of Sevastopol, rather, down to Balaclava. And that was eight miles away. And uh, the rifle battalions had uh, double quick marched from Balaclava, those eight miles to, uh, or from Sevastopol. I need more gin. From Sevastopol to Balaclava, and so by the time they got there, they had already basically ran eight miles and were quite windy, and they arrived just in time for the battle to be over. They arrived uh, to see the remnants of Cardigan coming back from uh, their charge, and uh, for all intents and purposes, the battle was over, except for this one Russian battery. It's described as a six-gun Russian battery up on the hill 
and it was almost certainly one of the batteries that had been, you know, cannon to the right of them, cannon to the left of them, cannon before them. One of the Russian batteries that had fired against the light brigade. Now that the light brigade had uh, withdrawn, they're looking for targets of opportunity, and they see the two battalions of the British rifle brigade moving up ahead of the fourth division. And so these gunners said, about the maximum effective range of about a thousand yards, um, casually open fire on the advancing fourth division, and uh, and again the the enemy, the British fourth division and the the rifle brigade advancing in front. They're a thousand yards away. There's no reason for these Russian artillerymen to be in any kind of haste or hurry. So they're taking their time. And bear in mind, in 1854. The artillery branch of the military, the artillery and the engineers were, were the intellectual branch. That's where the uh, the men of, uh, of the greatest education, and it was uh, it was the scientific branch. Frederick II famously said, "You know, artillery lends dignity to uh, what otherwise would be an ugly brawl." And again, it's the only branch in conventional military understanding at this time that can actually reach out and engage targets at ranges beyond 200 yards. Um, and then the ones needing to do range estimation. They were, yeah, they were really the only ones that had to have that, that specialized, um, specialized knowledge. And uh, another topic for another day is how the rifle, as the first modern infantry weapon, um, forced soldiers to become more than just a a robotic automaton loading and firing a smoothbore musket and not really caring where his bullet goes. The rifle, uh, the adoption of the rifle forced the militaries of, of Europe and eventually the world to have to train soldiers and the soldier becomes more than just this uh, you know, blindly obeying barked orders. He has to think for himself. He has to calculate his own distance. At this time in the Russian army, that was strictly the purview of a few Russian rifle battalions and artillery. And so here, the Russian artillerymen would have been estimating their distance and, and watching their follow shot, and they would have been lobbing round shot into the um, advancing 4th Division. And uh, General Cathcart commanding the 4th Division. Now bear in mind, the entire 4th Division was armed with smoothbores, but the rifle brigade was used was, to supplement them. Yes, the rifle brigade uh, was advancing in front of them, kind of as a, a screen or a skirmishing force. And they obviously had, uh, they received their, their mini rifles in February. So they had had them for you know, some time. And prior to that, they had been armed with the Brunswick rifles. So they already had known they, these soldiers were the rifle brigade. They knew a bit about, uh, about rifles and, uh, and were very proficient. General Cathcart uh, specifically requested uh, a, a lieutenant in the rifle brigade, a very 25-year-old lieutenant, uh, Arthur William Godfrey, to advance with a small section that's been, dis period sources describe it as a company um, or as like a, uh, a group of skirmishers. It was about a, a squad to a platoon size element. It certainly wasn't a company. Godfrey did not command a company. Uh, but think 10 to maybe 20 riflemen. And uh, General Cathcart asked him if he couldn't advance and try to silence those... The single lieutenant. Guns. The, uh, the lieutenant with 20 men said, can you go forward and try to silence these Russian guns? Uh, and of course, uh, Lieutenant Godfrey, uh, who had done similar feats before he had... Uh, he had enlisted, or he had been commissioned, rather, into the Rifle Brigade at about the age of 16, and he had fought in the, well, what was then known as the Kaffir War, the Third Kaffir War, uh, where he had been wounded in, uh, in, in South Africa. And so he has, he's already a combat veteran, he's already um, spent, uh, he's 25 by this time, so he's spent the last nine years of his life shooting rifles and, uh, and a great deal of that uh, time in combat against a very determined enemy. And um, he had already been distinguished outside of Sevastopol 
um, holding his ground against a Russian sortie. So General Capcut would have known who he was and they would have appreciated his skill at leading small units of men. So General Capcut asked if he would go forward with this small body of troops to try to silence this Russian battery. And they were uh, about a thousand yards away. The Russian guns at the time, um, you gotta bear in mind all the artillery, the field artillery of this era has to be drawn by horses. So the lighter you can make the guns, the better. Uh, these Russian guns would have differed very little from the type of guns they used during the Napoleonic War. They were almost certainly bronze, which is lighter than iron or, or you know, God help us, steel, um, so that horses could easily draw them. Probably between 6 to 12 pound smooth war guns that had a maximum effective range with solid shot of a little over a thousand yards. So they were at about their maximum effective range, just lobbing solid shot into the, the British lines when uh, General Capcourt sent uh, Lieutenant Godfrey forward. The mini rifle, an area target you could engage at a, a thousand yards. The bullet would carry that far and... Um, it's a large it, bullet. It's, it's, a, it's a, yes, it's an enormous bullet. Uh, but uh, it, it could, the sights on the rifle went to 900 yards. And with some training, soldiers could fire even beyond uh, 900 yards. But that's for a fairly large area target. Uh, to engage an artillery battery, Lieutenant Godfrey needed to get a little closer. And he advanced, and, and as he described it, he took advantage of every slight undulation in the ground. Um, and you can imagine the Russian artillerymen, and they're, they're watching this group of 20 green-jacketed riflemen uh, approaching them, uh, covering a couple hundred yards. Uh, Lieutenant Godfrey didn't explain how they did it, but you can imagine they would wait for the Russian guns to fire and then either sprint uh, or, uh, or crawl along. He just said they took advantage of every small depression in the ground uh, to give them cover as they advanced on these guns. And he advanced them up to about 600 yards. And 600 yards is about the absolute limit at which the P-51 rifle could engage a man-sized target. And what's the caliber on the P-51? It's a 705. 705? 705 grain? caliber. Cal All right. Yeah, it's a, the bullet was uh, 690, but uh, it had a hollow base so that it, uh, it could be easily loaded, but when firing, there was an iron cup in the base of the bullet. Uh, just like the, the actual Minier bullet, not the later Burton bullet used in the American Civil War, but the real Minier bullet, iron cup, that was driven forward into the base of the bullet when the rifle fired, and that's what expanded it into the rifle. And so it was 705 caliber when it left the barrel and weighed well over an ounce. So Lieutenant Godfrey advanced to about 600 yards. And this is frustrating for the Russian gunners because the Russian artillery were using fuses that were essentially unchanged from the Napoleonic War. And um, if you're firing case shot, which is an exploding shot, the, the explosion of the shell isn't actually what causes the damage. The explosion simply bursts the shell apart while it's still moving at high speed. And that spreads out the, uh, the fragmentation and these case shot would have been filled with, with bullets, with lead balls. And so when they would burst, it just scattered this over an area. But the slower the projectile is going, the less effective this bursting is. And six to 700 yards for Russian case shot of this era is about their maximum range. And uh, any further beyond that, and the, the falling fragmentation would cause contusions, as the, the British described it, but it, it would not, unless it maybe hit you on the head, I imagine that could be fatal. But uh, no, it's going to bruise you, but it, it's not uh, going to be a serious wound. 
and of course canister that could switch to canister. But that lost its effectiveness at about 350 to 400 yards. The, these British riflemen, the only shot they could really fire at them was uh, was their case shot at the maximum extent of its range. And, and, uh, the Russian artillery was inferior to the British artillery of the time. The British had better fuses, they had a higher muzzle velocity, their artillery case shot could engage at longer range. These Russian guns, by comparison, were, were uh, far more primitive. So they could fire a case shot at six to seven hundred yards at the periphery of their range, or they could fire a solid shot against this group of 20 or so riflemen. Uh, Lieutenant Godfrey said the shot was passing thick and heavy over their heads, which um, I would interpret as case shot, but uh, they could have been firing round ball. Um, at either rate, the Russian artillerymen were doing their absolute best to fire on these uh, crazy British riflemen that had come within 600 yards. And that's when Lieutenant Godfrey uh, opened fire. And what happened? Then what happened? And what I happened? Uh, for about 20 minutes, it was a duel between antiquity and modernity. Antiquity being the, the Napoleonic, the, uh, the linear black powder musket era of warfare, which was represented by the, the Russian artillery, uh, versus modernity, which is the modern infantry soldier, who's armed with a modern infantry weapon that can engage individual targets on his own at, uh, at long ranges. And for 20 minutes, this went uh, back and forth. After a few minutes, the Russian artillerymen uh, realized um, we're, we're in big trouble. And, and you can imagine this, the Russian artillerymen firing at the, the British riflemen as they advance, um, hearing the British bullets. Now, the, the, we fired infield muskets, which, which use a very similar cartridge to the the P-51 Mini-8. And, and when we fire them, we can hear the bullets flying down range, just going down. And so the Russian gunners were certainly hearing these bullets flying in among them, and, uh, and one by one, um, hitting the gunners as they serviced the pieces. And, uh, and you have to guns. imagine the bronze guns. If, if a one ounce piece of lead flying at about seven to eight hundred feet per second hit a large piece of bronze, it would ring out like someone is clanging a bell. And uh, I'm sure that would have given a little more sense of urgency <laughs> and purpose to these Russian gunners. Uh, but after about 10 minutes, they realized we're really getting the worst of this. And they began to hunker down behind their guns and uh, Occasionally, they would jump out and try to reload to, uh, to fire. And this is about the time that Lieutenant Godfrey, who is by all accounts an exceptional shot, he began having his soldiers load their rifles and hand them their loaded rifles. And he would uh, aim and fire at the Russian gunners whenever they would pop out from behind their cover. And so in this way, he probably could fire five or six aimed rounds per minute, but uh, over the next 10 minutes, he completely silenced the Russian battery. The Russian gunners, uh, every time they attempted to dart out and reload their guns, he would shoot the gunners as they were trying to load. And um, he silenced the battery single-handedly. One British lieutenant, 600 yards away from a battery of six guns silenced them and after uh, about 20 minutes after the first British rifle shot the Russian artillery um, finally said we've had enough they grabbed their guns and began pulling them away to the rear and they withdrew so one British rifleman not only silenced but drove away a battery of six guns which is a feat unheard of in Western warfare up to this time. And um, 
and again, that's why I call you know, the Battle of Balaclava the day of warfare change. You've got infantrymen, just simple, plain old line infantrymen, defeating a, a determined cavalry charge when, by all rights, under the old rules of warfare, they should have just been uh, ran over like bowling pins. And you've got one, you've got a group of 20 British riflemen not just silencing, but driving off the battlefield a battery of artillery with their regular infantry weapons, no specialized weapons. This was what every single soldier by the end of the Crimean War, every single British regiment either had their P-51 or the P-53 rifle. So this isn't some specialized secret weapon. This is every single soldier has it. And the regular weapon that the regular infantryman has is defeating artillery. Artillery, um, infantry, and cavalry. And cavalry. And it, it massively increased the power of the infantry. Period sources would... Uh, um, they seized upon Godfrey's exploits as uh, kind of a... a a bright point in the Battle of Balaclava because the Charge of the Light Brigade uh, after Tennyson <laughs> got hold of it, you know, someone had blundered, there's not a reason why uh, all that was left of them, left of 600. Um, the, that just, it, it eclipsed, the Light Brigade eclipsed everything else at the Balaclava. Um, the 93rd got some deserved recognition. And there are even some misconceptions about the 93rd it being this this um, you know, desperate holding action, and just by the skin of their teeth, they they held off the uh, the Russian cavalry charge. But um, very clearly, they uh, they halted long before any any charge happens. They did. Uh, well, Sir Colin Campbell told his soldiers, "You know, this is where we die." I, I don't. Uh, he placed his faith in the rifle. But he and his soldiers knew full well what was going to happen if their rifles didn't do their job. Um, you know, fortunately for him, uh, they did. Unfortunately for the for the poor Russians and uh, uh, you know Russell, who uh, who wrote the phrase "the thin red" or the, "the thin streak tipped with steel." He was the Times correspondent at the Crimea with very colorful language. He inspired uh, Tennyson. And he ended up covering the, uh, the, the American Civil War quite a bit, he quite did. to his he was, detriment. He was quite prolific. <laughs> he was not welcome anywhere. Yeah, yes. um, but uh, Still sold newspapers, though. Yes, he had, uh, later at the, the Battle of Inkerman, he described the mini rifle as a, a destroying angel. He said the, the mini rifle it, it smote the enemy like a destroying angel, which is uh, an apt description. Uh, you have to put yourself in in the position of a Russian soldier, a Russian cavalryman, a Russian artilleryman, where you know your your weapons, the weapons you have, cannot hurt the enemy, but the enemy can can effectively engage you at these long ranges. Uh, it's uh, rare, very rare in warfare that you encounter uh, a situation um, as as clear cut as this. Uh, Eduard Todleben, who was the Russian engineer, probably more responsible than anyone else for holding the line at Sevastopol for as long as they did, uh, complained very vigorously that our muskets uh, we have to be within three hundred paces of the enemy to hit them with their muskets, but the British are hitting us at 1,200 paces with their rifles. Um, and so I, I... And they I, truly realized that at Balaclava. At Balaclava, and particularly uh, not many days later at uh, Anchorman. Which is a story which is for a different day. A different day, but that's when they realized we, uh, we are not able to defeat the British in the field that all we can do is hold out at Balaclava and try to outlast this siege. So my last question to you will be, do you think that there's another battle in the 19th century that has 
lasting and um, overwhelming effects on, on military history that, that people really can point to and say military doctrine, military procedure, military history changed that day as much as Balaclava. 19th century? That's the, the century. Very, the very, very end of the 19th century, 1899, the Boer War, where the, the Boers uh, with Mauser, with seven millimeter Mauser rifles, took, uh, took rifles to the next logical step. Now, a year earlier, at Omdurman, 1898, the British were still fighting in very much the same way they fought in the Crimea, in closed ranks and the uh, the with the giant square. The, with the square, and the dervishes very obligingly fought them in the way the British expected to be fought. And they, they had Maxim guns and everything at this time, and they just cut them down. Um, and, uh, and that experience at Omdurman, the British thought, well, this stuff still works. And they took Crimean War era tactics. Uh, in the Crimean War, uh, the British tactics were ridiculously ahead of their time. Uh, their logistics were, were uh, total shambles. Um, they, they were very, very good tactically, and, and, and they, they failed crucially in, in that one aspect of modern warfare that matters more than anything else, that is logistics. But uh, they fought at Omdurman in the old Crimean War style, in closed ranks with volleys and, and the whole nine yards, and won. Against uh, against the army of the the uh, dervishes, but uh, a year later, in uh, South Africa, the Boer riflemen uh, utilized the modern rifle the way it uh, to the full extent of its capabilities, the same way the British utilized the P fifty one Mini rifle to the extent of its capabilities, and the uh, and the Boers. You can say they, it was a dress rehearsal for World War One. Um, behind trenches, trenches on on the ground level, not up on a hill, not uh, not at any height, and they relied on the flat trajectory of their Mauser rifles to uh, to do the work. No more rainbow arcs. No more rainbow arcs. These are very high velocity, flat shooting rifles, and they and and, uh, and three pretty remarkable battles. These, uh, these, these Boer farmers uh, gave the, the advancing British uh, bloody noses, one after the other, at Colenso and uh, Magersfontein and um, the Modder River and etc. But uh, now that's the only, un unfortunately there's no battles of the American Civil War that uh, you could say tactically were Infantry battles. There's uh, the, the only remarkable battle uh, in the American Civil War, you could say, that changed um, or that demonstrated new technology was the ironclads at Hampton Roads. But, uh, you know, again, the British had already seen that coming. They had ironclad. HMS Warrior they is ready Warrior to go. was already in commission. They, but, um, yeah, I'm sure this is a, a topic for another discussion, but the American Civil War was a, a, a tactical and strategic regression. And, uh, and the weapons that they had were through really no fault of their own due to the fact that you have volunteer armies of, of rank and competence, including your officers. You have officers commanding regiments who don't know the first thing about war. The contrast could not be greater to the British regiments in the Crimea, where you know Sir Colin Campbell had been, you know, in the army since uh, since he was in you know long trousers, and, uh, you know, like soldiers like Lieutenant Godfrey have been shooting rifles since since they were they bought their commission at the age of sixteen. And, uh, well, I blame McClellan because he was he was there. He saw it. He was yeah. He was there. In the he Crimea, should have, so he should have done better. He should have seen something. <laughs> should have taken notes. So thank you all for uh, staying with us on our long discussion on uh, the Battle of Balaclava. Um, hopefully it uh, changes a few perceptions 
about this battle and uh, it, hopefully um, it sparks some discussion on the day that uh, modern warfare changed for the average infantryman. The day that changed modern war is, is evident. Yes. Well, thank you all and until next time, carry on. Show me away. Sorry.